Well, we're in Acts chapter 21. It's an interesting little passage. You know, we've been following Paul. He's on his way back from his third missionary journey. Uh, he has left uh, 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 basically what would be southern Greece uh, and made his way uh, up uh, and, uh, and across uh, and coming down, aborted a boat for uh, leaving uh, the Ephesian elders on the beach there at Miletus and uh, apologize, I forgot to uh, pop in a, uh, one of the maps for uh, the slideshow here. But uh, basically what we'll see him do is uh, basically jump on these, uh, these ships that are stopping at every port and eventually he'll get on a bigger ship, make his way uh, eventually all the way back to, uh, to Caesarea. Uh, the issue here is that in every city, he has people saying to him, telling him, don't go. And, uh, you know, what awaits you there is not good things. And we're going to see that, uh, that continue. We saw a very dramatic scene with the Ephesian elders on the beach there. Uh, as he's telling him, you'll probably never see my face again. I'm headed to Jerusalem, and I pretty much know what's going to await me there and so forth. So a lot of, a lot of dramatic uh, goodbyes going on, and, uh, and we'll see one of those as well. Uh, the, the controversy in this uh, among uh, believers... Uh, and uh, commentary writers and so forth was Paul in God's will by going to Jerusalem uh, he's warned he's warned very uh, dramatically we'll see uh, in this text uh, that he would be imprisoned and so forth so is he is he basically just operating out of uh, pride and an ego and he thinks he knows best uh, maybe uh, he's uh, you know just a careless decision uh, that he makes here by being imprisoned and then uh, preventing uh, maybe a fourth mission trip and what the Lord wanted to do through his life. He certainly had uh, plenty, plenty of warnings. There are, there are people that, uh, that feel that, and they, they would say that, uh, uh, you know, it kind of worked out in the end, but, you know, all things work together for good. But it doesn't mean that Paul made the right decision by going to Jerusalem. Uh, of course, there's others that, that uh, would say that uh, these were predictions. Paul knew what had awaited him. Uh, and as he'll state in his own words, he's, he's more than happy not only to be bound, but actually die for, for the Lord. Uh, and I think in this, uh, uh, there's something of our own American Christianity here that uh, we need to think about and, uh, and examine. Because we pretty much live in a have-it-your-own-way kind of a culture. And uh, I was just reading about some of the... You know, where everybody you know, goes to Subway and you can tell them what you want. You go to Starbucks... I, I wish I, I should have Googled uh, the most outrageous order at Starbucks or something because people come in and I want a double latte, I want a decaf, I want a low fat, I want 140 degrees, I want one shot of mocha, one shot of caramel, I'd like a little salt on that day. You know, it's just like, who, who orders this? And uh, I'm watching the person. They're not even freaking out. They're just like, Tom, like, check that box, write that down. What's your name? You know, and uh, unbelievable. And I come up and go, coffee, hot, about that big. Yeah, that's, you know, it, it's amazing, you know. Uh, one of our favorite restaurants to hit on the mainland is Chipotle because it's what Subway is for Subway sandwiches, they are for burritos. You know, you get in the line, you tell them exactly what you want uh, on, uh, on, the, on the burrito. It's very large, very good, and very reasonable. That, that was, those are some of the other reasons we like it as well. But, but now there's a, a restaurant called uh, Korean Five where you can get what you want in five minutes and tell them exactly they have Indian, Mediterranean, as well as tacos, where you tell them what you want. Have it, have it your way is kind of the motto. And having your own way in terms of God's will, I think, can be very problematic for us uh, as, as Christians. Uh, just want to read this one quote from, from Kent Hughes. Again, you'll have a sense of, of his view. Was Paul being prideful or was Paul being incredibly brave and courageous in wanting to follow God's will? And he says, quote, the Holy Spirit had told Paul that prisons and hardship were awaiting him in Jerusalem. It was a wrenching goodbye, quote, after we had torn ourselves away from them. This was a traumatic emotional experience. And yet Paul did not proceed towards his difficulty, his difficult date with destiny reluctantly. He sprinted to meet it. He knew what awaited him. He wasn't reluctant about going to Jerusalem. He couldn't wait to get on the next ship and keep the journey moving forward. Well, let's look at the, uh, the believers that are predicting trouble for Paul along the way uh, as he approaches Jerusalem. That's in the first nine verses. Now, it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail running a straight course, we came to Cus, 
the other day, uh, the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For the, there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we'd come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children uh, till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. And when we'd finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to uh, uh, Talamas, uh, greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we who were with were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Uh, now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So predictions along the way. So traveling from Miletus to, uh, to Tyre, uh, again, he's sailing kind of the, he's on the, the local bus, stopping at every port. Uh, in a sense, he wants to be on the express. So uh, they board a ship for Phoenicia. 400-mile uh, journey. So again, he's in the Aegean Sea. He's headed north-south, headed towards the Mediterranean. He's able to get on a much larger vessel. How large? It takes them seven days to load and unload once they uh, arrive at Tyre. Uh, and notice verse 4, finding disciples. So uh, Paul is uh, out looking for them in terms of how, how these people came to, uh, to know Jesus Christ. It was uh, through uh, persecution back in Acts 11. Uh, when the uh, church is being persecuted in Jerusalem, they were basically driven out. And it mentions cities that disciples went to, uh, and this is one of, one of the cities. It doesn't appear there's a, a lot of them. There's no reference to a synagogue that Paul could find them at, uh, yeah, but he does find uh, disciples there. Uh, and that's what Paul does. And he's in a city. They're going to be there seven days. Hey, let's do some ministry. Let's find some people that need to be encouraged. Uh, let's... Uh, Find some people that need, uh, you know, to uh, hear the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. One writer said that uh, the two things uh, that Paul did when uh, he saw when he traveled, uh, lost humanity and a cross that could save them. That's what he was uh, primarily concerned about. Uh, again, uh, the prediction then from this group of disciples uh, is similar. Uh, verse 4, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to, uh, to the Jerusalem. So, again, through the Spirit means that the Spirit told them, and, and, uh, and again, is he, the, he's, they're telling him what he's heard already. Trouble awaits him. Uh, that's going to get more specific here as we go through uh, these other believers uh, uh, speaking with Paul and being concerned for them. Uh, but again, so they don't want him to go. You know, we had a, if you had a friend or a family member that said, uh, uh, you know, I really believe it's God's will, and I've been praying about this for a long time, and I've arranged my passage. I'm going to go be going to Liberia next week as a missionary. You might go, you know, I don't know that that's really the best idea. You know, why? Because I, I, Ebola is going on there. You wouldn't be real, real thrilled about the, that, that idea. Would that then mean it wasn't God's will? Well, see, that's what Paul's facing here. He knows what awaits him. They're speaking through the Spirit. God's Spirit is revealing to them what awaits Paul. Uh, he's hearing it over and, and over again. Uh, the question is then, is he being prideful, not listening to them? Can he just humble himself and take some advice from somebody else? Uh, or is he truly in, uh, in God's uh, will? We have another very difficult uh, goodbye here. Uh, they, uh, they've only been together for, uh, for a week. But it's, it is interesting uh, you know, to be with believers uh, from another place. You hardly know them. You're only there with them a few days. And you know, if you spend some time worshiping, praying together, being in the Word together, doing ministry together, it can be some pretty tearful goodbyes, even after uh, just a week. We certainly have, certain, uh, have experienced that a number of times over the years. Now, I don't, I don't think uh, Luke's trying to just waste any words here when he tells us that, and then when they went, and they went down to the beach, even all the wives and the kids and, uh, and everybody comes. So it's... Uh, uh, it'd probably be a, a tearful enough goodbye with just the guys. But now we've got the, uh, the wives and their kids down there kneeling on the beach, praying for Paul, and very, pretty much begging him not to, uh, not to go. Uh, in our text, uh, in verse 4, when it says that uh, they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up, it's in the present tense. It means they told him repeatedly, repeatedly to, uh, uh, to not go to Jerusalem. So another difficult uh, goodbye. 
uh, the prediction of his trouble there. Third, is confirmed in the home of, of Philip. He arrives at Caesarea, the port city of, uh, of Jerusalem. It's a very interesting reunion when you think about it. Now remember Philip, uh, we haven't seen him uh, what, uh, for a number of chapters, been time, it's been 20 years since we've seen Philip. We meet Philip and he's a young guy, he's in Jerusalem. There's a dispute over uh, giving out financial aid and food and help to widows. There was a concern that the, the Hellenistic Jew, Jewish widows versus the ones from Jerusalem, uh, they're kind of getting left out. The apostles uh, appoint seven guys over this ministry that are all uh, Hellenistic Jews. So that would settle that question and so forth. Uh, a lot of wisdom there. And one of them is, is Philip. Uh, Philip is uh, serving in that ministry uh, caring for the widows uh, and so forth. Then God calls him up to Samaria. Philip's really the first missionary. He's the first one to kind of think outside the box. Everybody else is sharing the gospel with, uh, with Jews, sharing it with other Jews. He actually goes up to Samaria, uh, and he's up there preaching the gospel. God does a tremendous work, a great revival. The whole city comes alive, and they're hearing the gospel. People are being healed. Uh, it's the you know, first, first revival through our first missionary. He said... Peter and John are sent to go up there, not to encourage Philip to see, but to check it out and see what this guy is doing. They're probably a little upset by it. They don't really like the Samaritan people at all. And, uh, and so they go up to check it out. They see and say, hey, they've received the, whole, the same Holy Spirit we have. It's authentic. It's a real deal. Uh, and they're on their first, what we'd say, short-term missions trip. Uh, they are up there. You'll notice they, do, <laughs> they don't share with anybody. They don't preach to anybody on the way there. But when they see what God did with another people in another culture, different from themselves, they get a bigger picture of the gospel and what God can do uh, in terms of saving people that are unlike themselves. And then on the way back, they are preaching the gospel. Uh, Philip then is then... Uh, uh, basically directed by God to leave that revival in that large city to go down to the Gaza Strip. And uh, there he's standing on the side of the road and he meets a man from, uh, from Africa, from North Africa. Uh, he's a Jew leaving Jerusalem. He's got a scroll. He opens it. It's a scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> and uh, you remember the scene? Philip sees him going by. There's an official. He's in his BMW chariot and everything. Uh, he's a pretty, probably a you know, wealthy guy. And, uh, and, and Philip's kind of... <laughs> running along beside of him, and he hears what he's reading. He says, I can tell you who wrote that, you know, tell you why he wrote it, you want to know. And so he gets up. Anyway, he leads him to the Lord, he baptizes him, uh, and then he goes back and shares the gospel there in uh, North Africa. And of course, the Coptic Christians in Egypt that are being persecuted for their faith today trace their spiritual ancestry uh, back to the Ethiopian eunuch, this man from uh, Africa that takes the gospel back home with him. Philip then is raptured. He's caught up by God supernaturally, uh, dropped down there on the coast of the Mediterranean, and he's been there apparently for uh, 20 years, long enough to have these, uh, these four uh, daughters. Uh, the other thing about this reunion that makes it interesting is that Philip uh, and his friend Stephen that he would have ministered with, uh, be, we remember Philip becomes... Uh, hears of the news of his good friend's deaths. Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church uh, at the hands of Saul of Tarsus. It's 20 years later, and now Philip is going to welcome into his home basically the man that murdered his good friend. But they're all believers now. So this is a, very, this is a little very interesting reunion. And I'm sure Philip knows quite well the stories uh, and, uh, and what uh, God's done in the life of Saul of Tarsus, whom we refer to as, uh, again, Paul the Apostle. The other thing that's interesting, it mentions Philip as the, an evangelist. Uh, that means he's not a pastor. That means he travels. He travels a lot. That's what it means. He's an itinerant evangelist. He travels around sharing the gospel uh, in places. Uh, but it's kind of neat. I, I don't think it's, a, again, just a, a mistake uh, in, in words here, the, the reference to his four daughters. Virgins just mean they're single. He's got four single daughters. Sometimes the focus is on the fact that they, uh, they were prophets or prophesied, uh, and, and, and obviously that's, that's true. Uh, but I think it's the idea that he's at home. He's at home with them. He's not out as an itinerant evangelist because uh, obviously here's a guy that's put family first. 
uh, and he's there, and he's ready, ready to receive uh, the Apostle Paul into his home. So along the way, believers are projecting trouble for Paul with good reason. They're concerned, uh, and the question is, is, God's in, uh, is Paul in God's will or not? Uh, he secondly is going to see a prophetic demonstration of his future there uh, in Jerusalem. That's in verse 10 to 11. We're reintroduced to a prophet named Agabus. Verse 10, uh, and as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So prophetic demonstration from uh, Agabus. So uh, these guys know each other. Uh, Paul and, uh, and Agabus, uh, we read about them uh, earlier back in uh, Acts 11, uh, where they were involved in a, uh, basically a famine relief program, we might say uh, together. Uh, Agabus, uh, mentioning him by name, apparently is, is, is well, well known. Uh, again, uh, in that passage, he made a prediction, a prophecy that has now come to pass. Uh, again, Acts 11:27. And in uh, these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Again, that's where Paul was, uh, uh, Antioch, Syria. Uh, then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the whole world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. They're living in those days now. Agabus has prophesied and predicted of a future event uh, that has come to pass. They are now living in those days. That's why Paul's also bringing an offering back to the church in Jerusalem because they're hurting. They're hurting because of the famine. They're hurting because of when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus as the Messiah, they're often, if their whole family doesn't get saved, they're ostracized from the family and probably from the family business as well. And so this offering's been collected for them. So anyway, Agabus is a, is a known prophet. And what he does secondly is uh, uh, does a, a demonstration Old Testament style. He takes Paul's uh, belt, he wraps it around his hands, he wraps it around his, his ankle, he binds himself and says, so will happen to the man that owns this, this belt. This is kind of a classic uh, Old Testament style uh, prophet. Uh, Jeremiah at one point in time, God told him, uh, I want you to go and buy yourself a beautiful sash, put it on and wear it around the city of Jerusalem, which he does. Everybody's like, man, that's awesome, man. Where'd you get that, you know? Did you get that at Ross's? You know, would you get a good deal on that or what, you know? Was that on Tuesday? Did you get your senior's discount? You know, and Jeremiah goes to the city, uh, and then, and then uh, God tells him, okay, that's good. Now, now go wrap it up and bury it in the, in, the, in the dirt under a rock down by this river and leave it there for a while. Uh, and then he tells him later, now go dig it back up again. Not looking so good. Uh, and uh, he, now he says, now put it on and walk through the city. When people ask you what happened to that belt, you tell them this. What happened to this belt is what's going to happen to this city because God is bringing judgment upon it. Similar kind of thing. Ezekiel, he has Ezekiel build a model of Jerusalem. He says, here's the city. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah, now smash it. And he smashes it. This is what's going to happen to the city in terms of uh, the Babylonians coming to judge you because of your sin of idolatry and turning away from God. So this is kind of classic uh, a miming, if you would, of what's going to be happening uh, in the future. Now notice his, his exact words here in verse 11. Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. This is a prediction of what's going to happen to Paul uh, pretty specifically. Uh, he basically is going to be taken by the Jews. Now he's going to be turned over to the Romans, to the Roman government. That's the idea of uh, the Gentiles there. Now, is Agabus telling him he should not go? No, not at all. He's just telling them what will happen when he goes. In fact, if Paul doesn't go, and if this doesn't happen, what kind of a prophet is Agabus at that point? He, at that point, is a false prophet. So he certainly has not... He's telling them what's going to happen in the future. He is not telling them uh, to not go or somehow if you do go, you're, you're out, of, uh, out of God's will. So there's predicting trouble along the way. Uh, again, a big scene at, with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. 
Uh, another one where they even bring the women and the kids down and let them sob and cry a little bit for the Apostle Paul uh, to try to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem. Uh, there is a prophetic demonstration of what would actually take place, uh, but Paul seems intent on going. Uh, thirdly, uh, the pressure is building on Paul. We'd say Paul's friends will plead with him not to go to Jerusalem, verse 12 to 14. Now when we, uh, we, the we, again, Dr. Wright, uh, Luke writing here. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. So uh, we first point out that the, the pleading included Dr. Dr. Luke, verse, verse 12. Now we heard these things, both we and those. So it's Luke, it's Timothy, uh, it's everybody uh, that Paul has discipled. It's his, his trusted companions, uh, his friends that are with him, plus those that are there. Who's that? That's Philip. Uh, very looked upon, admired, and so forth. Uh, and they're pleading with him uh, not to go to, uh, to Jerusalem. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, a lot of pressure on Paul. Uh, very, uh, you know, it could be uh, just unbearable. Uh, he obviously believes that he must go, that it's God's will for him uh, to go. Uh, again, a wrenching farewell from the Ephesians. Uh, and now all of this, the drama of the prophecy being acted out. And we'd say, uh, secondly, if Paul would react to the pleading with the ultimate statement of submission. Verse 13, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? And then he'll go on to say, hey, I'm not only willing to be bound, but also to die for the Lord. A similar statement that Peter made, of course, at one point in time. And he did go on and uh, deny the Lord. Though all deny you, I would never do. I would die for you. And of course, uh, he did deny him three times. But of course, we know that the Apostle Paul uh, never did. Uh, they kind of end this whole thing by saying, the will of the Lord be done. That's either said in frustration or conviction. <laughs> one, of, one of the two. They see they are not getting anywhere uh, with the Apostle Paul. So ends the epic third journey of the Apostle Paul. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a strange note to end it on, but that's basically where, where it ends. Uh, he's uh, refusing to compromise simply because there's some affliction that awaits him uh, in Jerusalem. So again, the question is Paul in the will of God. Is the Holy Spirit contradicting himself? Again, Paul's epistles and his writings were inspired. He was a great apostle. Did he just make a bad decision? And if so, why did he make that bad decision? Uh, why didn't he listen to his friends? After all, the Bible says there is wisdom in the counsel of many, and everybody he knows and trusts is giving him the counsel not to go. Uh, well, again, uh, there are people on both sides of this, uh, this argument, but uh, I want to give you uh, my, my side. Uh, in saying that there are six proper reasons why Paul went to Jerusalem. And in that, I'm going to give you some practical reasons, things Paul said to himself. Uh, we'll look at some of the letters that Paul wrote after it was all over, uh, looking back. What was the outcome? Because we, we know the outcome. Uh, he is going to get arrested. The prophet uh, Agabus was correct. Uh, he will uh, be taken by the Jews. He'll be handed over to the, to the Romans because Paul will be able to say, oh, by the way, I am a Roman citizen, which kind of saves his neck again. He's taken to the Antonio Fortress, and uh, we'll have fun looking at, uh, uh, at those guys. And, uh, and they basically assign him. Uh, uh, you can look at the text, special ops guys, and surround him and get him out of town and over to Caesarea. Uh, two years uh, in prison, several trials there. Uh, then to Rome, two more years uh, in, uh, in prison there. Uh, but Paul's up, up for the task. Let's look at these, uh, these reasons. Paul says, one, that he was going to attend Pentecost as a Jew. He was supposed to do that. You know, he was supposed to, if he could, uh, get to Jerusalem three times a year uh, for the three major feasts. He was able to get there for Passover. He's trying to get there for Pentecost. We would say that's a proper reason. That's a good thing. Secondly, Paul, in his own words, would say he's going there to worship God. Over in chapter 24, in one of those trials before Felix, uh, he, says, he says that very thing over in Acts uh, 24, 11. 
because you, made, uh, you may ascertain that there is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. This is the reason I went. Hey, I'm trying to attend a Jewish feast. I'm Jewish. Uh, no mystery there. I went for the purpose of worshiping the Lord. That's, that's a proper reason for uh, doing what he did. Three, uh, Paul went to deliver an offering that had been collected, as we've already mentioned. Uh, he mentions that, chapter 24, verse 17. Now, after many days, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. Uh, which kind of begs the question, why don't you let Timothy take that offering? You know, why don't you let Titus take that offering? Why don't you let the guys from those areas that collected the offering take the offering? And, uh, and, the, and the offering could have gotten there. The, the, uh, the money they collected could have got there. Um, the help could have got there. Uh, but the problem was not just the money. Uh, the problem was a division between Jews and Gentiles and the whole struggle that's going on. There was the Acts chapter 15 council. Uh, they, they determined that, Jew, that, uh, that the Gentiles come into faith uh, in the Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people that are preaching the gospel to them under the Jewish leadership uh, in the Jewish capital of, J of Jerusalem, it would be okay for them to not become Jewish. They could remain as Gentile. And of course, uh, James uh, pins a letter and uh, it gives uh, restrictions to us guys uh, that are still binding today uh, in terms of what our conduct should look like uh, in the church of Jesus Christ that is made up of Jews and Gentiles. But obviously that doesn't settle the deal. You've got uh, within the church there, you've got former Pharisees uh, and former priests and so forth. And they just have this slight little bent towards the law for some reason. Uh, and it continues to be a problem. And we'll see it uh, as we study the letters of uh, Paul himself. Paul wants to be there. Paul wants to be the guy. If there's somebody that's going to be able to bridge the gap between these two people, it's the guy that created the problem, Paul. He's the guy out preaching the gospel uh, and seeing uh, Gentiles come to faith in Jesus Christ. He's created the problem. He's uh, certainly a great person to be the one to bridge the gap. Why? He's a former Pharisee uh, and I believe a member of the Sanhedrin at one time. Studied with Gamaliel, one of the great rabbis of all time. Uh, the perfect guy to try to bridge the gap. It's more than just the money. He wants to come and bring the money and say, this is how much they love you. Do you love them that much as well? Will you accept them and accept the council of Jerusalem and what they said over them? So yeah, he could have, he could have sent the money with someone else, but we're seeing three. This is a very good, proper reason for Paul delivering the offering and going to Jerusalem. Four, Paul knew that hardships were part of, uh, part of God's will. Uh, yeah, the fact that they're telling him, oh yeah, hardships await you in Jerusalem. Paul would say, tell me about it. <laughs> Paul spends 25% of his missionary life in prison. I mean, we saw him in prison in Philippi for a period of time. Uh, again, two years in Caesarea, two years in Rome. And he mentions and other imprisonments that, uh, that are not detailed uh, in, uh, uh, in Luke's uh, narrative of, uh, of Paul's missionary life. He expected, again, based on the words of Jesus Christ, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you as well. Uh, no mystery, no surprise. Uh, so the idea that uh, some bad things are going to happen if you go there, uh, tell me about it. Some, some pretty bad things have already happened to me uh, over, over the years. Uh, and so he's going anyway. He accepts it as, as part of God's will. This is in contrast, of course, to uh, some preaching and teaching that is done to American Christians today that said everybody's a champion and everybody gets to have this. And if you'll just follow Jesus, he'll make you, you know, uh, you know healthy, wealthy, and, uh, and wise. Uh, this is in stark contrast uh, to the life of Jesus Christ, the life of the Apostle Paul, his expectations in serving the Lord, uh, as well as the clear teaching uh, of the New Testament. The fifth reason... Uh, Paul knew that hardships were part of his own ministry personally. Remember in Acts chapter 9, which is when Paul is converted on the road to Damascus. He's going, he's on his way to persecute the church there. Uh, again, it's been said that uh, uh, two events in the first century changed the world. One of them, top of the list, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the second one is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Because he goes from somebody who murdered Christians. It would be like the, if, if the head guy in ISIS got saved. Can we relate to that a little more now? 
I don't, I don't know that Paul was that brutal, but he, he killed people, he tortured people to get them to not be a Christian. And certainly that's going on. This is the Apostle Paul. Uh, his conversion in the first century is tremendous evidence uh, for the reality of Jesus Christ uh, and who he is and what he's done for us. Uh, he is converted on the, on the road to Damascus, uh, and then he's blinded, of course. He's taken uh, into the city of Damascus. God tells another believer, a man named Ananias, to go and pray for him, and he's like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, should I mention to you, God, that he's the one persecuting us? Yeah, go, go anyway. Uh, and he's warned right from the beginning what his uh, life would be like. Uh, now, over in chapter 20, when, uh, when Paul... Uh, is basically trying to explain to the Ephesian elders why he needed to keep going. He uses a, a very interesting phrase, and I want to read the passage so we get the phrase. We're going to come to it. He mentions it at the very end of his life again, uh, and, it, and it goes like this. We, we looked at it a few weeks ago. He says uh, to them, to the men there on the beach, And see now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may, and that's my underlined phrase, finish the race. Some translations, finish the course with joy. I am the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, God gave me at the very beginning a certain plan, a certain course, a certain strategy, a, a race I had to run. Uh, and I'm going to run it with joy despite the obstacles that await me. Uh, it's a ministry that I didn't go out to get. It's one that was given to me from the Lord Jesus Christ. I, that I may finish the race. Now here's the, here's the conversation and the conversion over in Acts 9 when Ananias is praying for him. Uh, and God's trying to convince Ananias to go over and meet with Saul of Tarsus. He says there in Acts 9, 15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So Paul uh, is under no delusion that somehow serving the Lord, uh, being obedient to him, preaching the gospel, is going to be a, a bed of roses. In fact, he's been told by God from the beginning, this is what I need you to do. This is where I'm going to lead you to go. And I'm going to use you in a tremendous way. And you are going to suffer. You're going to suffer. Are you willing to do it? Paul says, sign me up. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm all in. Whatever it takes. Because he had had his sins forgiven. Uh, he, he was... He was doing horrible things, and God had forgiven him and washed him clean and given him a, a place in heaven and a prominence uh, to be an apostle of his. And he goes, whatever it takes, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so uh, in terms of Paul going to Jerusalem, was he in God's will or not in God's will? Was the Holy Spirit contradicting himself here? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think there's many who are saying proper reasons, real legitimate reasons why he should be going. He was under no delusion that because you were a Christian, you shouldn't suffer. He just saw it as part of, part of the whole deal. Reigns on the righteous and the unrighteous uh, alike. Uh, people that say otherwise, I don't think they've really read the New Testament. Uh, besides that, his own personal ministry, he was supposed to be anticipating uh, the things that he, that he went through. I think that probably helped a little bit when he got beat to a pulp and thrown in the prison in Philippi, at least to know that uh, that... Well, the Lord said I'd have days like this. <laughs> we'll just trust him anyway. Uh, it would have been terrible if somebody had told him, oh, man, things will be awesome for you. Things will really go your way. You'll probably get a lot of promotions at work. Watch your bank account rise. You'll probably never be uh, sick a day in your life. Of course, if it is, because you don't have enough faith. Brother, if you just have faith and trust, you know, because words are a container. And if we take that container, we can use them for our purpose. I don't have to make this stuff up, and, and I only have to hear it a few times, and I don't want to hear, hear it anymore. Uh, it, keeps, it keeps getting repackaged and, uh, and coming, coming out there again. Very different, very different from what we see in this, this man's life. Now listen to uh, what he says to the church in, in Philippi. Now keep in mind, <clears throat> again, Paul is arrested. This all happens. He goes to Caesarea, a couple of trials there. Pretty awesome, though. One of the, uh, the first days in Jerusalem, if you're on a tour, you, you stand, you stand in the courtyard, the main mosaic that's still there of that court, of that court where Paul stood trial right off the, the Mediterranean coast. 
pretty, pretty cool to, uh, to see that. Uh, Paul's there for two years. He goes to Rome. He appeals to Rome as a Roman citizen. Uh, he stands trial before uh, Caesar Nero. He's awaiting trial for two years. He lived as a Roman citizen. He's allowed to live in his own rented apartment. Pays for it. Uh, he lives there. He's got Roman guards and so forth. But people can come and go, uh, and he's writing letters. Uh, and he writes a letter back to the church at Philippi that we've already, uh, already looked at. Uh, and he says this, a couple, couple, of, couple of things that, that are interesting here. Uh, this is looking back. Was that a good deal? Was that a smart move to go ahead and go to Jerusalem? Uh, and uh, this is what he says. Uh, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, his arrest in Jerusalem and so forth, happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren of the Lord have become confident by my chains are more bold to speak the word without fear. He says, you know, actually this all turned out pretty good. I know you guys are concerned about me. I'm over here in Rome and I'm rested. I'm waiting to uh, see this nutcase Nero and, uh, you know, make the case before him and stuff. But, um, you, know, you know, it hadn't turned out bad, actually. It's turned out pretty well. And uh, uh, these uh, Roman uh, guys that are chained to me, the, the guards, four hours, man. I got them four hours every day. They have to rotate. They probably can't stay to, uh, stand to see me because I, I just talk to them all the time. Yeah. You know that helmet you've got with those red feathers? That's like the blood of Christ right there. I'm going to call that the helmet of salvation. You see your breastplate? And it, you can imagine being chained to Paul for four hours. I think you probably heard the gospel a, a few times. He's just, it's through the whole palace guard. Now listen to what he says when, in the end uh, when he uh, signs a letter off in Philippians 4.21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those of Caesar's household. Caesar's household? Yeah, Caesar Nero's household. So who gets saved in Ciro, Caesar Nero's household? His wife, uh, her mother. And they're both executed for their faith in Jesus Christ. And many other family members in Nero. Nero was a wild man. And, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, the gospel goes throughout the palace guard. It goes throughout Caesar's household. And Paul says, and man, other guys are kind of getting stoked. They see me in chains. It's like, man, if Paul can do it, I can do it. Let's get out there and go for it with the gospel. I think it's all turned out pretty well. Paul says uh, in, in the end, did he see it as a mistake that he went to Jerusalem? No, I, I think he believed he was absolutely in the center uh, of God's will. Now, again, <clears throat> I want to go back to 2 Timothy and, uh, and bring us back to that phrase about finishing the course because he's mentioned that to the Ephesian elders. The reason I'm doing this is I've got to finish my race that God's got, got for me. And I said he uses it right at the end of his life again. So Paul stands before Nero eventually after two years uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> We assume because every time he got a chance to stand before a king or somebody important, he never defended himself. He just preached the gospel. Uh, Nero, for whatever reason, kicks him out, says, get out of here. Uh, and Paul is free to go, and he's free for a period of time to continue uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, he wants to try to get beyond Rome into Spain. Some, some church his, historians uh, uh, believe that he did make it that far with, with the gospel. Either way, in the meantime, Nero burns Rome so he can recreate it and remake it architecturally uh, after his own ideas and his own uh, image and so forth. <clears throat> there certainly is an uproar over that, so he blames it on, uh, on the Christian community that was very large at that time uh, in Rome, uh, and therefore that allows him or legitimizes the, the burning and the rebuilding if he can then show his enrage against Christians and he unleashes an empire-wide uh, persecution against Christians. Uh, again, the, this is uh, Nero. I mean, historically, this is a man that would take Christians, uh, dip them in tar, uh, put them on stakes in his garden, and light them on fire uh, at uh, night so he could ride through uh, his garden in his chariot uh, and scream at the top of his lungs. This is Nero. Uh, and so he's, when I said he's a nutcase, I mean he's a nutcase. Uh, he unleashes all this. Paul is rearrested. This time he's not under uh, uh, his house arrest in a rented apartment. He's in what's called a Mamertine prison. It's still there today in Rome. Uh, and uh, he's in a very dark, dirty place. And he writes one, one more letter uh, back to his protege, uh, Timothy. And he says this in chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but of power and of love and a sound mind. <clears throat> Therefore, because, hey, Timothy, this is no time to, to wimp out here. Uh, God didn't, if you're, if you're kind of fearful over, over this whole thing of church planning, preaching the gospel and so forth, there's no time for that because uh, that's not from God. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. He gave us one of power, love, uh, and uh, sound mind uh, of discipline. Therefore, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Why does Paul say that? Because some were. Because he, he's in prison as a common criminal. And some were becoming ashamed of him and the gospel. He says, but, we share, uh, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of, of God. So uh, things are uh, looking pretty uh, bad for, Timothy, uh, for Paul. He's hoping Timothy will arrive uh, before winter comes. Uh, and he says this uh, again in chapter 2. And I'm, we're going to look at a couple of verses here. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9. He says, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Even to the point of change, but the word of God is not cha uh, not changed. Now, I just point that out because that word "evil doer" doesn't mean common criminal. I'm in prison like a common criminal at this uh, uh, this juncture of, of my of my life. And uh, and basically, are you okay with that? Uh, are you coming? Are you coming anyway? Uh, and then in verse ten of chapter three it says, uh, "But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love." Perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them uh, all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, again, that's the idea. Uh, Paul saw that all along. All who, live to li all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Uh, we are very fortunate. Uh, in the United States. And we are very fortunate because we have the peacekeepers. Jesus said, blessed are the peacekeepers. That is the United States military right now. That's who keeps the peace in this world. They are the, blessed are the peacekeepers. That's why you and I can sit and do this, and two-thirds of the Christians around the world can't do this. Uh, they're in some cave somewhere, or they're in a home in a small group. Uh, and right now, by the thousands, they are being executed. Uh, by ISIS, we're talking children younger than 12 being crucified uh, in uh, in open streets. You know, you're seeing you're seeing some of the stuff on the news. There, there's a lot out there that's available, documented, uh, uh, and so forth. Horrific things that are that are going on. Uh, but Jesus said, "Hey, you know, you're going to live for me. There's going to be some bad things happen. You know, in in this life, you have to figure out pretty early on." Which life are you going to live for? This one or, or eternal life? The, the one that's uh, what's to come. Now, Paul says this at the very end of where he brings this phrase back again. Uh, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. And here it is. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. Paul says, I did it. I finished it. At the beginning, he said, he's got a, a race for me to run, and I'm at the end, baby, and I've done it. For him, in his own mind, to go to Jerusalem, go through what he did, it's, I'm convinced he would say, that was no mistake. Uh, it was even predicted by Agabus. That was the word of God. I had to go get arrested. How else am I going to get to these trials? How much am I going to get to Rome? How, much, how else could he preach the gospel to, to the, uh, Caesar Nero, which, which of course he did? Uh, later in Acts 23, uh, I want to say six. One more uh, very proper reason for going. He was able to say he made the decision with a good conscience. Over in chapter 23, back in Acts, he says, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, this would be the ones in Jerusalem, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded that those who stood by him strike him on the mouth. Uh, but he says, Hey, you know, he's here, I'm here. I've lived before God with a good conscience. Except for that really bad decision about coming down here and being arrested by you guys. See, he doesn't say that. He says, Hey, I got a good conscience before God. Later then, uh, in verse 11, uh, chapter 23, uh, this, is, uh, this is really uh, really awesome. He says, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness 
at Rome. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he wanted to do. His whole thing was get the gospel to major Roman cities. Uh, you know, see people get saved, see them get discipled, establish a church, appoint elders and leaders, and move on to the next major city. Those guys will carry it out to the, uh, the other smaller uh, towns and villages and so forth. He'd been to Corinth, he'd been to Athens, he'd been to Ephesus. There was one left he needed to get to Rome. And the Lord comes and says, uh, I know you're in prison here again, but uh, cheer up, man. You're going to Rome, and they're going to pay for it. We're going to get you there. Uh, we're going to give you the desires of your heart uh, in, that, uh, in that sense. Uh, it's what he wanted to do all, all along. Everyone that tried to persuade Paul not to go did it for one reason. They loved Paul. They loved Paul. Paul was convinced to go for one reason as well. He loved God. And therefore, he was going to do God's will. I, I want to just um, uh, uh, mention, uh, I think Dr., uh, Dr. Luke certainly comes on board here uh, with, uh, with uh, this really was God's will. Uh, and, uh, and I see that because uh, if you analyze uh, the text just a little bit and, uh, in terms of moving, moving forward from this point, I think Luke is very careful to point out uh, at least, uh, that I can find at least seven similarities between Jesus and his decision to go to Jerusalem, knowing what awaited him. We'd all say that was certainly God's will. Uh, and Paul's decision to go to Jerusalem and knowing what awaited him, uh, and we would say, I would say that's God's will as well. As, as well. Here's the similarities. Uh, they were rejected by their own people and arrested without a just cause, both of them. They were both unjustly accused and had false witnesses testify against them at their trials. They were both slapped in the face while in court. They were both victims of a secret Jewish plot. They both had a frenzy mob cry away with them. And they both experienced not one but a series of trials. Uh, Jesus had six and Paul had five. Three times both of them were declared not guilty in court. Uh, and I, I think that uh, Luke in writing and pinning the narrative of Paul's life includes a lot of little details so that we'll, because he's come to that conclusion and he's trying to show a parallel uh, of what's transpired. Again, we live in a have it your way culture. <laughs> and you can have it your way at Starbucks any number of ways. It's amazing. Uh, but, uh, but we don't want to think or allow that thinking to bleed over into uh, our Christianity. We don't, it's not a have it your own way Christianity. And I think we, we have a problem sometimes with this. And even when we talk about the persecution, the horrific things that, that are going on in the world today, uh, because we have a tendency to underestimate the future. We underestimate the future. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Christmas time this year. I'm talking about heaven and, uh, and eternal life. And it's good that, uh, you know, in both services to, today, you know, we've sung songs about the rapture uh, and about looking for the Lord. And that's where our eyes need to be right, uh, right now. We live in very interesting times. Uh, we, we live in a time where uh, this week, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke before the, uh, the United Nations uh, and, uh, and talked about the, the similarity between ISIS and, uh, and him, uh, Hamas, which there is. Uh, it's the same, same group of people by a different name doing the same kinds of things uh, and is criticized for it. And he met with our, our president, and they, they made nice uh, about uh, uh, what they'd like to do in terms of uh, trying to achieve uh, peace uh, in the Middle East and the concern o over ISIS and so forth. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, Netanyahu uh, pointed out that but we're still very concerned about, you know, those guys, Iran, trying to build an atomic bomb. That's kind of a, a concern for us and probably should be for the world as well. Uh, he went back the very next day. The mayor of Jerusalem, as you may know, then announced uh, a building project that had been on the books for a couple of years. And they're going to go ahead and go with uh, a couple of apartment buildings that happen to be uh, in East Jerusalem. Jews and Arabs will, uh, will live in those, uh, those buildings and everything. Our State Department uh, comes down heavy the next day and says that by doing this, Israel has isolated themselves from the rest of the world and their partners uh, because the Palestinians claim that uh, uh, they want, of course, uh, part of uh, East Jerusalem for their own capital when they, when they uh, uh, declare their own statehood and so forth. Not going to happen. They're not going to give up uh, Jerusalem. It's the eternal capital of the Jewish people. Uh, they give them a lot of whatever else is around and so forth, but they're not going not to get a, gonna give up that. Well, here we are in a world that says people in the world right now are more concerned 
about Jewish people building an apartment building in Jerusalem than they are the Iranians building an atomic bomb. There, there's something wrong with that. We're concerned about an apartment building for Jewish people, but we're, we're not so concerned about Iran building a bomb. Very, very interesting days that, uh, that we're, we're living in. ISIS guys have contacted Putin and said, hey, we'll cut a deal. We give you our oil fields if you'll give us an atomic bomb. These are you know, very, very interesting days that, uh, that we're living in. We've got volcanoes going off left and right. Uh, uh, we're just at the end of the end days here. It's uh, very interesting to, to watch it all. The Bible says in the end, every nation will turn against Israel. We're down to about one. <laughs> I pray, pray that, it's, uh, that we don't because I think uh, God withholds his judgment a great deal because of our partnership with Israel. God says to Abraham and his physical descendants, I'll bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. We don't want to be on that cursing side. And uh, very interesting days. Days when we should realize the spirit of the Lord is not one of fear, but is one of love and power and self-discipline. Paul says to Timothy, so it's not a good time to be ashamed of me and of the gospel. Are you going to be ashamed of me because I'm a common criminal? Timothy? And uh, obviously he wasn't. Can we have a have-it-your-own-way Christianity? I don't think we can. We just take whatever the Lord's got for us in this life because he's given us eternal life uh, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh
treasure and a new name. You're raising me up. You're raising me up now. Now the power of your mind, like the fire, like the lightning, shine and touch the sky. United in one voice, holy love. Together we rejoice, coming down from up above. Spirit full of love, praise lifted up. Call of your love in every tongue. In every time, united in one voice, holding love, together we rejoice, coming down from the Call of 